Um, so I want to take us back to thinking about the source areas of the migrants um, as they leave uh, rural areas, what's, what's happening to them. Um, before I really do that, I want to motivate a little bit. So I think a third of my presentation is going to be motivation, and then I'm going to talk through a, a bit of a review of the literature, or the what I, a bit of a review of the literature, let's call it, uh, the empirical literature on the linkage between migration and agriculture. So at least, if nothing else, I really want to convince you that we have to take an empirical look at these questions rather than just a theoretical look, because a theoretical look won't tell us exactly what's, what's happening. Um, so just to motivate a bit, uh, and I'm also going to not talk so much about quote unquote forced migration. Um, forced migration is maybe not the greatest term. I've been thinking about that for a second piece that I'm writing right now, but I'm not thinking about environmental displacement. I'm not talking about conflict displacement. I'm talking about people who are making decisions to leave to make their, presumably to make their lives better off. Okay, so that said, we know that there's, there's an empirical regularity, and Jakob uh, showed this this morning, I think, um, that countries with higher GDP have a lower share of labor in agriculture. Migrants might go to urban areas, they might also go to rural areas, and in fact, in the microdata from, from Sub-Saharan Africa, we see quite a bit of migration from rural to rural areas. Um, so just this, this picture, some of you have seen, those of you who are here for Jakob's presentation have seen this picture before. Uh, today, I'm going to show you another graph where I made up the, the letters um, because I was on the plane, um, but that's coming. Um, there I go, saying something stupid on the camera right away. Um, the, this, this is another look at it, though. So this is looking at just a cross-section. Anybody can pull this out of the, the world development indicators. This took me 10 minutes, literally, to make. Uh, and uh, I first saw this graph in graduate school. Taylor and Martin had it in the handbook a similar graph in the Handbook of Agricultural Economics on Migration and Agriculture uh, in 2001. This is the 2016 data. It has exactly the same pattern as the 2001 data. So it's, it's really, it's, it's still there, basically, is what I'm trying to tell you. Um, it's also in the World Development Report in 2008. S similar graph. So you can, you, can, you can go home and make this graph. It's really easy. Um, to show you a different view, this is what's happening to the rural population share in the 10 largest developing, quote unquote, developing countries, I guess anything down to, to middle income countries, um, so by population. So we see that Ethiopia has the highest, this is a 20 year look, so from 1996 to 2015. Um, in every single country we see the rural, urb, the rural population share decline over those, those 20 years. Um, so several countries have gone below. Indonesia and China are now below 50%. Uh, but everybody's seeing a movement into urban area. Every country is seeing a movement into urban areas. Um, and we also know that fertility rates are actually lower in urban areas. So this is kind of, should naturally be in, increasing slightly. OK, so that's to convince you that, that rural, urban, in, rural urban migration is a, a pretty important issue to be thinking about. Okay, second issue is that international migration is more complicated from a rural perspective, but um, one, many small countries rely on remittances for a substantial share of GDP. Uh, two, migration is quite an not the largest share of GDP for some of these larger economies, Bangladesh, Pakistan, the Philippines, Mexico, but it's an important source of labor for those, those countries. And um, actually, international migrant, the international migrant origin is often from rural areas. And, and I've just been putting, pulling this, whoops, okay. So this is, so second slide will be that graph. But the first one here is just remittances as a share of GDP uh, is, is actually 30% in Nepal, 38% uh, in Liberia, 29% uh, in Tajikistan. So there are quite a lot of small countries. I've actually, from this I took, a mix of countries, I left out the Pacific Islands because the, those have extremely high shares of GDP from remittances, but um, even a country like Bangladesh with a, country, with a population of 160 million has eight, almost 8% 8 of its GDP coming in from remittances. So remittances can be a really substantial share of, of GDP for some countries. Um, I think I took a mix from different, different uh, uh, continents in this context. This is the, the point on international migrant, migration from rural areas. I've just been pulling these, these 
statistics together, this is actually hard to find data on. Um, what I've got here on the, the y-axis is the percent of international migrants who came from rural areas, and then the share of the population that's rural on the, the x-axis. And you can see that there'd be like a 45 degree line, and most of the countries here uh, in, that I've found data for uh, fall on the, the 45 degree line. So the, the, data gen, the data here are difficult to find, in part because you need a fairly large data source um, that has migration information in it to be able to come up with a figure like this. And then if it's not a, a census, a few of these are censuses, but if it's not a census, then you need to have accurately defined weights to place on the, the figures. So to get that right is, is actually only possible for some countries, but what, what I know I've, I've seen some people say, I'm gonna assume no international migration from rural areas. It's absolutely not true. It turns out that international migration is very often at least originating from rural areas. Um, and so international migration can really have an impact on, on agriculture is the point of this, this figure. Okay, the third thing, so okay, so now we know, hopefully you're convinced um, Rural urban migration is happening, or rural rural, 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 rural migration is also happening, but rural urban migration is, is happening. International migration from rural areas is also happening at, at fairly large rates. So what I want to ask is really, what are those, what is, what are the effects of migration or increasing migration on the rural economies that migrants are leaving? Okay, so what I'm going to do is, first of all, I'm going to step back to an issue that Andrea and Julie were just talking about, which is the rural urban, what I'm going to call a labor productivity gap. And there's a, a very interesting debate going on in the literature right now that has some important policy relevance. So I want to cover that in five minutes or something, um, which is whether the rural urban labor productivity gap, which is this Harris Todaro kind of concept, um, is that due to migrant selectivity, meaning is it just individual characteristics of the migrants themselves that drive that gap? Or is it restrictions of some sort or migration costs that drive that gap? Okay? Um, and if it's, the, the two have very different policy implications if you want to generate higher incomes. So I want to kind of talk through that for a few minutes. And then I want to talk, so we'll, we'll do that. Then I want to talk about how migration should, affects rural economies, thinking primarily about agriculture. I'll briefly, probably talk, very briefly, talk about a conceptual framework and then describe some of the evidence in the literature uh, related to effects of migration on agricultural production, various types of investment, and then risk coping, which gets into the, the, the more of the Lucas and Stark type of, of model. And I'll, I'll hopefully then not have used up all my time, so I'll have a little bit of time to talk about conclusions related to policy, although I'm going to try to sprinkle that in throughout. Okay, so let's talk a bit about the non, the agricultural, non-agricultural productivity gaps. Um, I'm going to start with the cross-country literature, actually. Uh, Gollin, Lagacos, and Wa put a paper in, in QJE uh, in 2014, which originally was a purely cross-country paper looking at the, um, at the, the difference in returns to agricultural and non-agricultural labor. They find a ratio of about three unadjusted on average. So when you move from an, people who are in ur urban areas or non-agricultural labor make about three times what people in agriculture make. Um, even a, that number drops to about two once you account for hours worked and, and human capital. Um, but there's a pretty, basically what they're saying is that there's a pretty big gap between returns to agriculture and returns to, to non-agricultural labor. Um, and there's actually some similar papers by da uh, Maggie McMillan and Danny Roderick showing essentially the same thing across a, a larger uh, set of, of uh, activities. So agriculture is always the least remunerative activity. So why are people staying in agriculture? Well, Young in the QJE, a year before Gollin, Lagacos, and Wah, who actually added a lot of microdata to their paper to get it published, um, Young argues that this gap can fully be explained by selectivity. So what, what do I mean by that? I mean that he argues that it's just characteristics of the migrants and nothing else. A lot of those characteristics are probably unobserved um, in most data sets. He uses DHS data 
So you can critique him for um, the fact that he's predicting consumption rather than actually using consumption. Um, and those predictors probably don't explain much more than 20% of the variation in consumption. So there's a very easy critique of the paper and, and what he's showing, but, um, but the argument stands that all of, the, all of it has to do with this risk taking that you're not measuring, um, or that people, people are more willing to take risks, or people are more adventurous, or people are, have these unobservable traits maybe not completely unobservable, but un unobservable in very large cross-country data sets. Um, similarly, uh, there's a, pa a paper that came out last this early this summer by uh, Joan Hicks and Ted Miguel and some co-authors, which also argues that selectivity can explain the entire gap. And they're using long-term panel data from both Kenya and Indonesia to make that argument. And so they're, they once they put individual fixed effects and and year fixed effects into their model, they may be over explaining the data or overfitting the data, which is a, a potential problem with that, that model. Um, but they also think that, that selectivity may explain the entire gap between agricultural and non-agricultural labor. Okay, so what, is, what does that mean for policy? Well, it means that you, if you wanted to encourage, well, if you didn't want to encourage migration, you're probably fine. But if you want to encourage migration, you need to think about how to, encourage the, uh, those unobservable traits, developing those unobservable traits in people, or de-risking the migration for people who would need, would need to move. Okay, on the other hand, uh, there's another, this is a structural paper by, by Gerard Bryan and uh, Melanie Morton, um, also a working paper, although I think it might be a revise and resubmit, um, that shows in Indonesia migration costs play an, an important role in explaining the wage gap. So they don't, Selectivity explains about a little more than half, and the rest of it has to do with migration, quote unquote, costs. And here is this what I mean by costs is literally costs, but then, you know, the psychic costs of, of migrating or, or thinking about migrating. Um, or it could be transportation, it could be like not knowing about the jobs, and there's a lot of evidence from, you know, from China that 50% of people know, actually know a family member in the city that they go to before they migrate. So we know that there's a lot, that there are ways of reducing those costs to improve those, those livelihoods. So, the, so what I want to conclude here is that um, selectivity probably plays a bigger role than we might have otherwise thought in explaining that two number, that double, uh, that, that non-agriculture being double as, as uh, remunerative as, as agriculture. Um, but there may, there's probably a, pl a role for these migration costs as well, and, and it probably varies quite a bit from, from place to place. Okay, so then, so we know that that exists and we can think about policies to, to address that. Um, so how does migration potentially affect agriculture or non-farm rural activities? Well, when a, when a migrant is sent out, there's a loss of potential labor to work on your household farm. So I'm, I'm a micro thinker. I'm always thinking about micro data. So, you know, apologize. That's my bias. I'm, I'm going to lay it out there right away. Um, so I'm thinking about, you know, a migrant leaving the farm and all of a sudden you've got one less farm worker. Now, in data I've collected in Senegal in the last couple of years, that might not be a big deal because the average household size in our experiment was was 16 and a half in that data, which is actually what I presented here three months ago two months ago um, in this very room. Um, it, if, it's, if you're talking about China where you've got four laborers in the household at maximum now, that's a much bigger change in the potential labor availability to your household. Um, so that's going to be very context specific, very household specific, what, what that means. Um, the migrant may also send back remittances which can be invested in some way. Right, so those you could consume those remittances, um, and then there are a bunch of different types of investment that you could make. So I'm going to take you through a literature on on the investment. Um, and furthermore, agriculture is agricultural production is really uncertain. And one of the you know one of the more empirical regularities that we've seen is that uh, migration is is a, a, a a strategy to deal with that risk. It's a, essentially a way of, inf it's a method of do using informal insurance. 
So you send a migrant away and, and you know that the covariance between your income and the migrant income is going to be much lower than if they work locally in some, uh, in some sort of, you know, in some self-employment or something like that because the, the returns to your labor in the rural area are all going to be highly correlated and, and related to the um, to fluctuations in the, uh, in the, the rural economy. Um, that said, you know, some, there are some countries that are so rural that that may not hold. I'm thinking specifically of Mozambique, where I've been working for a number of years. Um, and one of the things that, that actually, just a quick anecdote, um, I was working on a mobile money project with uh, Vodacom in Mozambique. And my, uh, my survey workers had told me, if you want to buy anything in Mozambique, you buy it in February. Well, why February? Because the rainy season is about November to March, and everybody spends all their money at Christmas, uh, and then in February, nobody has money, and this is true in Maputo, they, he said as well. And uh, I'm re relaying this story to the, the head of mobile money for Vodacom as they're, they're rolling out M-Pesa in, um, in Mozambique. He says, oh yeah, I see that in the data. Uh, he he's says, well, yeah, I can see, you know, nobody's got any cash, and in February, because nobody's trans making any any um, nobody's making any any uh, transactions in February relative to, to other months when people have money. So you can even see it in in you know in these rurally rural economies. Uh, it, it comes through in a lot of different places. Okay, so the theory is we need to figure out if there is this lost labor effect. This is where you get empirical, right? So if we know that this lost labor effect could be there, it could be that people make adjustments to deal with the loss of the labor. You can change the composition of the family labor force working in agriculture, so you can neglect the kids a bit more, for instance, is one thing to do. Um, and, and the people who are left behind can work there. You can hire labor. We know about problems with, uh, you know, from theory again and, and some empirical work of, of the problems with monitoring agricultural labor. Agriculture is spatially dispersed, so it's, it's more difficult to monitor laborers. You can make capital uh, investments or rent capital as well to replace that labor. So it could be you do one of all these things. Um, migration could also lead to investments. It could be productive. It could be on the farm. But if, if returns on the farm are low, we might not see those, those farm investments. We might see non-farm investments instead, right? So because the, re the expected returns to those investments are higher. It could also be in durables. You just want to, you know, if you think about it, buying a TV is like if you're in one or a refrigerator in one of these rural areas, assuming you have electricity, it might be a much more valuable um, uh, way to use the remittances for yourself because you get a stream of consumption essentially from that television or that refrigerator that you wouldn't have gotten otherwise. Um, <clears throat> And third, you could make longer-term human capital investments. And there I'm thinking both of education and young and investments in nutrition of young children. So then third, I want to talk a bit about the way that, that households deal with risk, although I'm probably going over right now. Okay, so are there, is there any evidence of lost labor effects in agriculture? In ge general, this is, of course, a problem. You guys have heard it probably ad nauseum over the past couple of days about the endogeneity of migration, so I'm not going to go too much into that. Um, there's not much convincing evidence in the literature. There are a lot of papers in China. Um, outside of China, I've written a paper on, on Vietnam. I, I wrote Northern Vietnam on the slide. I'm pretty sure it's just Vietnam. Um, that shows some suggestive evidence of a shift from lab labor intensive to land intensive crops. Um, and Agnes Kasumbing and Scott McNiven found a null result in the Philippines using a small panel. Um, the interesting thing about their panel is that it's a 20-year panel rather than, uh, I think it might be, may even be a little longer than that. Um, but they were looking at people who had left households that had been studied initially by uh, either Erie or IFPRI in, in the 1980s and were tracking households and found really nothing, no effects on agricultural production <coughs> of migration in general. I like to go to this, this graph. I'm going to spend a little bit of time on this slide because I think I'm going to take three different data sets from China and try to convince you that you know, if there was a lost labor effect, we might find it here. Um, the first graph is from the China Health and Nutrition Survey where they've asked a really kind of poorly designed set of questions on agricultural labor, but they've used those same poorly designed questions over a long period of time. So since actually 1991. 
Um, and I'm showing you data from 1993 to 2009. Um, the, the survey's been sporadically uh, done when they were able to find funding. Um, so what, what this shows is that if you look at, the, these are averages at the household level. So they, the households in 1993 reported spending about 2,700 hours um, a year in total on their farms. By 2009, that average was down to 1,400, okay? So it's almost, they've almost cut the hours that they report working on their farm in half. Some of that might be that you used to go stand on, in your field and talk to your neighbor because you really had nothing else to do um, in 1993. But I, I, since the questions have been asked the same way over a long period of time, I don't think that that bias, quote unquote bias, is going to change this whole figure. The other thing is to say is that this is a conditional figure. So this is conditional on reporting any farm work done. So this, the, the line, the orange line there, um, is the percent of households that say they do any farming at all. And that has changed from about 90-ish percent to a little bit under 70 percent over that same period of time. And these are, I've taken the part of the, the CHNS is an urban and rural survey. This is just the rural villages. Ooh, I'm down to five minutes. Okay. The, the same thing, the, what I want to next stress is that plot level productivity gains, so this, this is from a regression I've just, I'm just showing you the time dummy from a totally different survey. This is a panel where we can't quite link plots, but we can link households. Um, and this is just looking at, at the main grain in each village. So we dummy that out with a village fixed effect. And we see that uh, crop productivity went up by 25 to 30%, depending upon if you're looking at all counties or poor counties during a time of substantial migration. So we're seeing productivity levels actually go, go up quite a bit. Okay, um, thinking about investments, investments in product, production can occur. Uh, they're inherently risky. Um, so you might want to invest in durables or housing. Another investment is, is schooling, that's complicated. And of course, statistical identification is an issue. <coughs> um, so thinking about investments in production, there's quite a bit of, of, of uh, evidence that we see long-term migrant networks, this is in the international literature, uh, that lead to higher investments in microenterprises in Mexico. That's by Woodruff and, and Zintano. And Dean Yang used exchange rate shocks in the Philippines and finds uh, an impact on self-employment and, and entry into new types of entrepreneurship in the Philippines. Um, that said, uh, the, the the randomized experiment, uh, the natural experiment that Gibson, McKenzie, and Stillman use shows, a neg shows negative effects on agriculture and livestock in the short term from emigration to, uh, to New Zealand, uh, from Tonga. Uh, and a last piece of, of data, uh, John Giles and I have a paper that shows positive impacts to productive investments among well relatively well-off households in China, but we're using a village level migration variable and the, the poor households are the ones that are more likely to migrate. So this is likely a general equilibrium effect in which uh, there is more money coming into the village and those richer households are then able to make more productive investments. Um, those aren't necessarily agricultural, actually they're not agricultural investments. What's more, more um, common to find are, are potentially safer investments in, and, and those are investments in housing. Uh, Una Silly has a very nice paper showing, uh, which is a matched uh, survey of, if, of Nigerian immigrants in the US and their households, which shows uh, the development of casas de remesas, uh, or, or migrant houses, remittance houses as they're called in Spanish all over Latin America. Um, you can find pictures like that one all over the internet if you look for Casas de Ramesas. Um, we find that that's a major source of what, that's what Chinese investment, Chinese households are doing if they're not investing in, in consumption, if they're not eating their remittances. Um, there's a nice paper also that I, that I found in trying to find more information, more papers that, that show migrant migration and housing linkages. Um, this is a paper in the anthropological literature. Um, which argues that Pakistani migrants um, in Norway actually invest in, in housing to have a little piece of, of Norway back in Pakistan when they go home. Um, and, and she's done qualitative interviews to, to show that. 
Okay, uh, I'm going to skip um, schooling and go straight to risk, actually. Schooling and, and young child nutrition. Um, and there's an old idea in the, the literature that migration is advantageous to rural households because of that covariance of income. <clears throat> and um, there's a nice experiment by Brian Chidori and, and Mubarak, which shows that, which argues essentially that poor potential migrants may not leave due to risk at the destination. They're worried they they don't leave during the hunger season in in uh, in Bangladesh, in Northwest Bangladesh. They give them money for a bus ticket and uh, are able to uh, convince the, the randomized giving bus, bus ticket money. Uh, and those villages that got bus ticket money are still migrating at higher, seasonally migrating at higher rates than the other ones. Now, this, this relationship can be complicated because we do a lot with policy to try to deal with insurance risk. Um, and in particular, um, I, I want to talk a little bit about the M a program like the NREGA or the MNREGA, depending upon how, what you want to call it, in, in India, uh, which is essentially a guaranteed workfare program in, uh, in India. Uh, there's a similar one in Ethiopia, the PSNP. And what, what Melanie shows is that see, there's quite a bit of seasonal migration actually in India. India tends to have seasonal migration rather than, te than permanent migration. Um, and seasonal migration affects the risk sharing that takes place in, in the community. So when there's more migration due to the co covariate risks, households have less need for, actually, for actual insurance. Um, and then she finds evidence consistent with this idea. So it turns out that when you bring in MNREGA, it reduces the amount of migration that is taking place, which reduces the amount of, um, of insurance that households have. Okay, um, I'm out of time, so just to summarize, uh, we've, we're talking a lot in the world about policies to hinder migration right now that may also hinder increases in returns to labor on average because those in returns are just higher outside of agriculture. Um, so we should think about how we, we design policies to realize migration is happening rather than trying to hinder it. Um, other policies that foster rural investment in say housing or productive investments um, that we'd like to see that move towards non-farm work because of the, the returns. Um, and then lastly, I want to say that policies seemingly unrelated to migration may have important interactions. Um, you may not have the same welfare enhancement from a policy like MNREGA if there's a high migration area. Um, other policies that, ex that change expected variant returns or variance of returns in agriculture may inter also interact with migration like land tenure reform. Um, and we should think about, as we think about these types, you know, these types of, of issues, thinking about things like basic income grants, they're very hot in the policy world um, or the development uh, world right now, but we should also think about how those basic inf income grants will affect migration and how, those, how migration will affect the results of those, those grants. Okay, thank you. <laughs>